Welcome to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast, where the cross and the culture are on a collision course for discussion. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require signs, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, here's your host, Thomas Irvin. I pray the ideas expressed here do not prove to be prophetic of America's future. What do we say of a country which votes in its own oppression? They invite captivity in exchange for a false sense of virtue. But collectivist propositions of this sort may prove more interesting than expected. Social justice, equality, and equity sound great until despots have made all equally desperate. How does one convince multitudes of indoctrinated generations with cultish religious beliefs of the terror ahead? At the very least, let us begin here and now. Despite the words taken up over past generations to quell this matter, consider the multitude of lives lost in the name of utopia. Lives will continue to be lost as men try and build paradise on earth without God. Paradise by way of political dominance described by a ruling class of hypocritical cowards. I will not be an accessory to America's deadly direction. Give me liberty or give me death. But liberty I have. Despite the dictates of rulers, I have been made free indeed. We have traveled these roads before. Political correctness silenced men slightly. The next stop, cancel culture. Used to suppress men publicly. But what comes next? Maybe secret police of some sort visiting men in the night? Who will stop our country from traveling further down the road to collectivist camps? Not the men and women who choose lascivious living over inherent responsibility. Our men dominate video games, but fail to be husbands. Drunkenness and fornication are exalted hobbies, while life as a dependable father is shunned. Americans are willing to straddle many fences, committing to whatsoever is personally beneficial in the moment. No thought whatsoever for the future, as though the evils of the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany would never happen to red, white, and blue. This lack of principle has dire consequences. As Americans continue in this fickle exercise, it seems apparent they are not prepared for the reward of their selfishness. Great bravery is now required to break this mold and interject truth into a world deeply steeped in confusion. If we all said no to utopia now, maybe we could forego the ideologies that result in literal gulags. Unfortunately, It seems continued cowardice will provide collectivist leaders the space needed to usher in this dystopia. It is increasingly challenging to be a patriotic American. The challenge is aided by homosexuals parading naked through the streets and children aborted in their mother's womb. If the child were allowed to live, they would be read to by transgender persons dressed in lingerie. So one might ask, why fight back? Because the coming gulags will be far worse than whatever we have experienced thus far. 
Men like Alexander Solzhenitsyn made this very clear, and it seems we will require another Solzhenitsyn in the future. Gulag and archipelago, two contrary terms, cryptically define collectivism's realities. Gulag, a despicably harsh prison camp for people dubbed political enemies. Archipelago, a group of islands which are amongst the most beautiful scenery on earth. Only disciples of communist theology are capable of merging the two. In their eyes, dissent equals to guilt. The American version of Article 58, I'm sure, is soon coming. Patriotic? For what? My allegiance belongs to Jesus Christ. Solzhenitsyn wrote copiously at a time when writing was not only difficult but dangerous. We write now in a time when it might be difficult but not yet dangerous. Many Americans can no longer distinguish between the two. Far too many see difficulty as danger. Our video game society is soft-natured. Solzhenitsyn wrote, then memorized, then destroyed the evidence. Our men, they memorize movie lines on Netflix. Ironically, movie lines meant to groom their minds for the collectivist takeover. Solzhenitsyn wrote of his life in the Soviet gulags. American men are afraid of being called nasty names. The Nobel Committee awarded Alexander Solzhenitsyn their highest literary honor. Today, the Nobel Committees are nothing more than a communist support group. They award Nobel Peace Prizes to individuals or groups who will destroy any semblance of peace. How ironic to live life as a communist and receive a peace prize. Solzhenitsyn exposed the depths of communist corruption and the unprecedented death that followed. The West fought communism, even publishing Solzhenitsyn's books, which proved destructive to the Soviet Union. Now, somehow, we are headed rapidly toward becoming a communist state. The Gulag Archipelago quenched the utopian dream, at least momentarily. Communism was exposed, making all things naked and open for the world to see. This book, accompanied by the stench of millions of dead bodies, revealed the collectivist systems for what they are. These were the greatest practitioners of evil in the 20th century, and their doctrines have been revived. They have made their way to the highest levels of government in the most powerful country in the world. What exactly comes next? Equality? Men and women will be imprisoned equally. Equity? Men and women will meet death after gruesome toil together in the gulags. Social justice? Does the oppression of the entire society finally count as justice? Alexander Solzhenitsyn's book sold more than 30 million copies in its day. Sell them again. The world already forgot the corruption. They forgot the bone-chilling manipulation. They forgot the millions dead, the blood that flowed, and the doctrine that caused it. The world dreams again of utopia, not knowing this unruly fire will burn them. At the very least, the abridged version of Solzhenitsyn's book should be required reading in America. They should read it until the terms communism, socialism, and collectivism regain their well-deserved stigmas. The Gulag Archipelago crippled the Soviet Union. Maybe it will turn the heart of America. Our country has become the poster child for corruption. The rule of our governmental leaders are indefensible. We are bottlenecked into deceit but expected to play along. Soon we will be expected to report those who refuse to play along. That is unless someone stirs the national conscience regarding the shameful failure of communism and socialism. The theological underpinnings and cult-like adherence are the most oft-repeated recipe for disaster the world has seen. Nevertheless, we continue to see this religion faithfully implemented. Death is not enough to dissuade its adherents. Marxism relies on class division, and thus America enters identity politics. One look at Rwanda would help encourage those who toy with such deadly ideas. One million dead in 100 days due to the application of identity politics. 
If one finds a social justice warrior on the scene ready to defend a particular group identity, (laughs) you should run. Each group is taught to recruit hatred as an ally with retribution as their goal. Social justice expands as the mob dubbed themselves judge and jury. It's interesting. This seems to produce the desired outcome when you get to be both the judge and the jury. The courtroom will be live on the World Wide Web or televised as participants exercise their method of justice. Actual innocence is of no relevance, and it can be overcome by class association or group identity. One need not be guilty, just born with the wrong identity. Communism is as corrupt as its developer, proving itself so with each country's respective implementation. Communistic countries implode as the class struggle eventually identifies significant portions of the country as enemies, unredeemable and thus destined for necessary punishment. We see this already in America as our communistic-minded citizens struggle to keep up with the cult of wokeness. The woke heroes of today are devoured tomorrow for not going far enough. Such is the nature of collectivist mindsets. It is the natural selection of the political world. Thus, temporarily, one may extend the right hand of fellowship into the political beloved under the auspices of compassion. They intend to fight for the cause, manufactured or natural, Until identity politics makes the sudden discovery their group is also guilty of some injustice. Maybe it was 30 years prior. Worse, perhaps it was more than 100 years prior. Either way, the individual should have known better than to be born within such a group. They will waste no time with concerns over a person's lack of guilt on an individual basis. Attachment to a particular group will either condemn or justify in their sight. Of course, this means of judge and jury must be regularly revisited as each group moves back and forth from needful hatred to convenient acceptance. Movement within these group boundaries is predicated on the revolution's current needs, Marxist or Marxist cultural. These ravaging wolves are content with destroying individuals' lives as long as they silence dissenters and the revolution continues. Who exactly performs the group identity census? Who gets to draw these broad lines which eventually destroy careers, lives, and relationships? No one believes the Marxists of America possess a particular benevolence Marxists elsewhere failed to obtain. Today, they destroy bakeries and Twitter feeds. But tomorrow, they will be knocking at front doors to escort nonconformists to America's version of the Lubyanka. The trouble here is that few realize the role they will play in such an escort. Some are excited by a conception of themselves as faithful countrymen willing to force their fellow citizens into labor camps. Their ignorance will not be realized until the loyal escorts (laughs) become the escorted. Large segments of our country and their self-righteous mindset assume themselves to be in line with the dictates of the revolution. It may be true for a moment, but Solzhenitsyn said that Stalin could never conclude his enemies had ceased to exist. With Marxism at the root of such an ideological mindset, when and where does the revolution end? Every person must at some point become an enemy of the revolution. Indeed, as long as two revolutionary comrades exist in the world, one will not be radical enough for the other. The American ideal of individual rights, coupled with a measure of respect for others' beliefs, whether we agree or not, is not only disdain, but must be stamped out at all cost. Repeatedly, we have seen that men do not somehow corrupt Marxism through misapplication, but rather Marxism corrupts men. What else would motivate men to draw lines based on identity? The social justice warrior demands retribution for any racial disparities incurred by one group or another at any point in history. They insist that racism be corrected and that sufficient penance is paid. How exactly do they approach their desire to fight racism? (laughs) By dividing the people around them according to their race. 
They are appalled by the idea that one race would make economic decisions that hinder another race's stability. To correct the matter, they demand the implementation of their own racial disparities. They have concluded that racism is wrong only when directed at a group they have identified as having value. White men will soon have less value than that of an unborn child. Through heavy indoctrination by Marxist college professors, Marxist news media, Marxist social media, Marxist entertainment industry, and Marxist politicians, our country is taught their brand of hatred is not only acceptable but morally superior. Indeed, it should be lauded, and the feeling of hate is a sign of great virtue. Dissenters are beyond redemption, not due to some horrendous act they may have committed, but guilty by disagreement. Disagreeing with the Marxist theological approach to life guarantees one is guilty of the charges laid against them. To maintain revolutionary virtue, differences of opinion must be destroyed with a self-righteous vengeance. We have entered a dispensation in America where the evils of this present world are considered guidelines for utopia. Marxists are excellent at propaganda, and currently, they own the entire media machine. With little to stop them, they manufacture moral guidelines and talking points at a moment's notice. Whatsoever the sudden revolutionary direction, the entire media conglomerate is out in full force driving the narrative. One cannot help but wonder, are they aware of the coming corpses? Is their moment of fame brought about by their propensity to virtue signal in extreme forms worth the imminent destruction? Regardless of their answer to such questions now, this will go too far before the realized damage. As long as group identity is endlessly inclusive and exclusive, there will be no limits to the future trouble. Vanity, vanity, saith the preacher. This game is one of vanity. Money talks. Fame whispers in the ears of those who desire it. To be praised by the revolutionaries is nostalgic, even addicting. In contrast, to oppose the revolutionaries is to be crushed by the power of the media. The appetite for power coupled with the growing ability to pit one against another is a recipe for disaster. The revolution will devour its enemies. Unfortunately, the machine will then turn on the old revolutionaries. Even if they could keep up with the woke mob's rapidly changing demands, lack of trust and honor is embedded in the Marxist revolutionary process. The old guard will become the new class enemy. Also, understand this appetite for power, control, and destruction will not be satisfied. Over time, every member of society will be deemed guilty and then unredeemable. The idea that a person is innocent until proven guilty is an unprecedented luxury America has enjoyed. In Marxist America, all are guilty. Only time will determine when the revolution seeks momentary justice. Mercy is not an option. In our country, people are emancipated from individual responsibility. Accountability is reserved for those deemed guilty by the association of their skin color. Everyone is or will be guilty, and everyone will be punished. None will escape the wrath of the revolution, not even those who helped to usher it in. Now, to my brother and sister in Christ, the gulags are coming. If you stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have ever stood for the Lord Jesus Christ, I may well see you there. I pray that as we cringe under the crack of the Marxist whip, that we will remain bold enough to sing praises unto the Lord together. None of us chose our place of birth, our skin color, our family's economic status, or cultural religious background. However, these random circumstances will be used to convict you. From a biblical perspective, our choices remain the same, Jew, Gentile, or the Church of God. Those are our only options for the basis of distinction and responsible discrimination in this life. Our God is no respecter of persons, and He expects that His people act in like manner. The Christian response to the coming troubles is 
crucial to our country's future direction. In Acts 1 6, the apostles asked the Lord Jesus Christ about the restoration of the kingdom of heaven, that is, the physical kingdom on earth. The Lord's response in Acts 1 7, and he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. The status of the kingdom of heaven is in God's own power. The times and the seasons are not even privy to us as Christians. Nevertheless, Christians are still focused on the physical earthly kingdom even today. But we are left with recourse. We are not left without power. The trouble is our focus is wrong continually. Acts 1.8 says we are given the power to be witnesses unto the Lord Jesus Christ, and as witnesses we are to take the good news of Jesus Christ into all the world. Not to topple governments, but to save souls. Group identity is a mission field. Within an identifiable group, a measure of reasonable credibility is given to preach the gospel. We do not discriminate based on gender identity or gender confusion. We do not participate in racial separation or disparity. We do not favor one person over the other due to their economic status. We want all men and women everywhere to understand all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Hell is no respecter of persons. Whatever your identity, sin has separated you from God. Likewise, Jesus Christ the righteous shed his blood for every person to ever enter this world, past, present, or future. Whatever level of confusion or understanding, he desires that all trust him, thereby allowing him to help make sense of this life through his word. In the West, we have enjoyed great comfort. Marxism seemingly dwelled worlds apart from our borders. We should read books like the Gulag Archipelago and think of a time and a place far away. That is until we begin to see the striking similarities in the direction of our country. The country that won the Cold War and brought an end to communism. We are nearing a time when we are on track to become the country that may need to lose the subsequent Cold War. Communism intends to remake man in its own image, detaching the individual from any sense of religious autonomy. If that torturous process proves to fail, which history has shown repeatedly it will, the next step will be implemented. They will guise evil with virtue and set every man against his neighbor. Under tremendous pressure to show proper fidelity to the communist masters, brother will report brother and husband will report wife. As these realities become realized, I pray Christians will remain faithful. Our commission does not change. If Stalin is president, preach the gospel. If Hitler rises to power, preach the gospel. In freedom and comfort, or prison and terror, preach the word. Be instant in season or out of season. The Lord will raise up preachers of his gospel. But let us pray the world will raise up another Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Our culture has developed a hatred for the words of Jesus Christ, but somehow it is considered intellectually prudent to nod favorably to Marxist dialectics. The verdict is in. Marx was a demonstrable failure, and his doctrine was implemented around the world, resulting in death, destruction, and collapse every single time. The revolutionaries are willing to take to the streets. They are eager to burn down buildings, ready to take lives, willing to choose sides. But are Christians willing to continue serving the Lord in the face of it all? We must press on, reminding the world around us that Jesus saves sinners. When the revolutionaries are cut down by the extreme and rapidly changing ideologies of this world, they can still turn to Jesus. When their seared conscience collapses under the grief of what they have done, they can still turn to Jesus. When they realize their utopia was a synonym for hell on earth, they can still turn to Jesus. However, 
Will faithful servants remain for them to look to in their day of trouble? Will there have been a witness in their town, in their neighborhood, in the political prison camp they operate? Our focus should be on the kingdom of God, even if it requires we suffer persecution in this life. Such is the status of the kingdom of heaven. Is self-sacrifice worthwhile? Who among you is taking up their cross daily? What about tomorrow? The individual cross-bearing in our daily lives has lacked far too long amid prosperity. What will that burden look like in a communist America? No doubt, some are prepared to implement a counter-revolution. But why is there no concern whatsoever for a spiritual revolution? A return to focus on the kingdom of God. As Christians in America, we may well soon face a crossroads. Will we participate in causing blood to run in our streets? Will you fight to extend a personal political vision of the kingdom of heaven? Are revolutionary and militia activities the answer? Is this the proposal to stop the current revolution? Why not make such sacrifices for the kingdom of God? Why not take to the streets and preach the gospel? Why not speak up publicly at work for Jesus Christ? Why allow the television to influence your family? Should we counter the revolution with revolution? How will your future rule look exactly? The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So it is there for the taking, if enough violence is applied. But have you considered, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh? The kingdom of heaven is in his power. The Lord will come back and set straight the corrupt governments of this world. Therefore, establishing yourself or your group as one of those corrupt governments places you in direct opposition to the Lord's imminent return. But why not apply this revolutionary heroism to preaching the gospel to every creature? It concerns me that so many Christians are willing to fight physical, temporal battles as though the weapons of our warfare were carnal. The utopian vision is designed in such a way as to justify the destruction and eventually the death. Let us be careful in developing a counter-utopia that justifies the same. Life is found in Jesus Christ. Peace is found in Jesus Christ. Acceptance in the Beloved is found for everyone in Jesus Christ. In the world, inequality is a fact of life. It will be with us always. Framed within the very concept of solving inequality requires that someone rise above everyone else to define and correct the disparities. That role, in and of itself, is inequality. But Christ can teach men in whatsoever state they are in to therewith be content. In all situations of social and economic justice, Jesus is the answer. I understand that fact will be rejected by the masses. The revolution will rage on and death will ensue. But the world's revolutions won't have my participation. We should understand by now any person who claims to be a socialist, a communist, or a Marxist intends to do harm. They plan to strip you of freedom. They aim to force you into discipleship. And the recent losses of American freedom are absolutely motivated by Marxist doctrine. That is, the free voters of our country have asked, by way of the ballot box or dominion machines, that utopian terror be our future orientation. <laughs> Even so, come Lord Jesus. But will the Lord find faith when he come? Thank you for listening, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can learn more about our ministry by visiting www.plenteousredemption.com. You can hear more Plenteous Redemption podcast audio at www.plenteousredemption.media. Please comment below if this podcast has been a help to you. Also, inform us of future topics that would interest you. Thank you again for listening to the Plenteous Redemption Podcast.